Webster's Dictionary defines geology as the science and study of the solid and liquid matter that constitutes the Earth. With that being said, the field of geology encompasses jobs such as technicians, engineers, scientists, and even chemists. Today we're going to explore the career and educational opportunities related to the field of geology. That's all this week on The Job. Geological science involves the study of the Earth's physical makeup, past, present, and future. The research involved in this field can explain the reasons why rivers, mountains, and natural phenomenons either exist or became extinct. Aside from this, the research of a geologist can be used in several other fields. The students in this class are enrolled in the Geological Sciences program at the University of Alabama. I visited the university's geological sciences department and spoke with Dr. Fred Andrus. Dr. Andrus is an assistant professor of the department and he spoke about the program and the geological makeup of our state. The geological history of Alabama is rich and the history of Alabamians using geology is rich. Uh, Birmingham is a classic example. Birmingham is where it is and is what it is because of the geology of the region. Uh, many people aren't aware of it, but Alabama produces oil, natural gas, more recently coal bed methane, of course coal, formerly iron mining. Uh, presently we do a great deal of uh, industrial mineral extraction, uh, building materials. Really, geology permeates Alabama's history. Now, geological sciences, I know that's a broad name, but, but what does it encompass? Everything that involves our planet or planets similar to ours, really, uh, for instance, I study past climates and the way the ocean works. Others uh, in our department study groundwater, rivers, the atmosphere, volcanoes, earthquakes, you name it. Really anything on the planet is fair game. And what developed your interest into to geological sciences? I think I, like many others, were just simply curious. We, we're curious about the natural world. We like being outside. We like figuring things out. And I would say anyone who's curious, that's the first and most fundamental trait that a scientist needs to have. Dr. Andrews gave me a tour of their department and shared with me the many wonderful aspects of their program. He then introduced me to Dr. Rona Donahoe, who is a professor of geochemistry. She showed me around one of their labs and talked with me about their role with local agencies. Uh, several local environmental firms uh, that have called us to get help with analytical work and interpreting the data that comes out of that. There are things that happen, like railroad car, ac car accidents, um, where a railroad car turns over, spills out contents onto a farmer's land. And we'll get a call saying, well, can you help us identify this white substance that came out of the railroad car? The farmer wants to know whether it's dangerous material or not. So we've done things like that. I've worked with uh, legal firms and industry on court cases that have come up because of environmental concerns. Students enrolled in this program are equipped with all of the necessary equipment that they need to conduct research, study minerals and rocks, and test samples. Yes, uh, my laboratory manager, uh, Elizabeth Graham, uh, she trains undergraduate students, graduate students, all of them on these instruments. So they get hands-on experience with how the data is generated. Because when they go out into the employment field, they are faced with getting mountains of data from analytical laboratories and unless they've got first-hand experience with how that data is generated they don't know whether it's good data or bad data and to protect our our drinking water supplies protect our environmental quality they really have to be able to assess that data properly while visiting i was introduced to several students who are working in the lab Brittany holland told me her views of the program Geological sciences is very interesting. It's um, not a lot of people are in it, uh, and that kind of makes it very. It's very close knit. I have a lot of friends here, and uh, just the science behind it. It's very diverse. You can do chemistry, you can do physics, you know, side of it. You know, there'd be geophysics, uh, geochemistry, structural, mountain building. 
I mean, you know, you take it for granted. You see, you know, you're driving outside your car and you see mountains and, you know, rivers and streams and lakes and, you know, you take it for granted. But then in geology, you find out why is that there, how it got there, you know, how it could change and, you know, environmental side of it, you know, if your river's polluted, you know, how to clean it up and things like that. Down the hall, Christy Jones was testing a piece of marble from the Parthenon to find out where it was quarried from. We were sent a piece of marble from the Parthenon from one of Fred Andrews' colleagues in um, Oregon. And what we do is we measure out about 70 micrograms and put it into this vial. We then take out all of the air with by injecting in helium. And so now all I have in this vial is a piece of marble, which is calcium carbonate, and helium. And then you add your... And then I'm going to inject my orthophosphoric acid. Okay. And what that's going to do is that is going to, uh, essentially it's going to break the bond between the calcium and the carbonate. And I'm going to have, uh, what I'm going to have is uh, carbon dioxide in my vial now because of the reaction between the orthophosphoric acid and the calcium carbonate, the byproduct is carbon dioxide. And we're going to then, with this sampling needle, we're going to measure the carbon dioxide that has been released. And the carbon dioxide used to be a part of this calcium carbonate, but now it's a gas. And now we can measure that gas. She demonstrated the setup of this procedure, and then she walked me through the process. Geologists, um, it's almost limitless, the people that we can work for. So part of our mission is accomplished. Yes. Being a geologist requires work outside as well as inside. Dr. Andrew Galiff, along with some of his students, demonstrated a device that's used in the field to measure the depth of a particular area. From what Dr. Gulliff tells me, this device can also find oil. So what we're doing right here is a thing called seismic reflection. And seismic reflection we use to actually study the subsurface. So we're doing this fairly small scale. We've got a, how, do you remember how long this cable is? 300 feet. 300 feet, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so a 300 foot cable. And we, in science, we like to use metric, so we'll say 100 meters. It's actually 100 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to teach them to use yes. metric here. Everyone's going to metric, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So this has a 300 meter long cable, and we can probably see down a couple of hundred meters here. Down into the ground? Down through the ground. So we're actually imaging the layers beneath us. So for example, one of the rock layers that's beneath us here is the Pottsville Formation, which is actually known for containing coal. So if you go up to the Brookwood uh, coal mine, they're actually mining coal from the Pottsville Formation. And that's sitting right underneath us. So one of the things that we can see should be the Pottsville Formation. Oh, okay. Now, if we're doing this in the oil industry, we'd, this would be much larger scale. So this cable, you know, when I do this at sea, we might have a cable behind a ship that's six to eight kilometers long, and we might be looking down 40 kilometers. Mm -hmm. And so this would be, in, in that sort of, uh, uh, setting, this would be the sort of thing that you'd be using, the sort of technique you'd be using to find oil, for example. So students such as these, they may well be using these techniques to go off and work in the oil industry. And for example, Jordan right there worked for ConocoPhillips during the summer. Wow. And uh, she was using this sort of data that we're going to be collecting today. Okay. So it's, it's really exciting it stuff. It sounds like it. Perfect. Now, you guys want to come and get the geophones? So we've got the cable, and the integral, the uh, very important part of this is, uh, or are the geophones here. Do you mind if I? Oh, certainly. Okay. Grab one. Perfect. They're, they're very hardy. You can swirl around. Okay. What is in here is a, a magnet and a coil with a current running through it. Okay. And when the magnet moves relative to the coil, it actually generates a current. Mm -hmm. And that current is then received on that instrument there. What that current tells us is how much the ground is moving. And so when we put this in the ground and I would stomp on the ground, that's actually going to vibrate the ground over there just a little tiny bit. And this is sensitive enough to pick that up. And when, say, people in the oil industry, can they 
find out? Could you use your device here and find out if there's oil under the ground? Uh, potentially. We actually have about two kilometers of cable in the department. And basically, the longer the cable, the deeper you can see. Okay. And yeah, we could actually potentially use this to find oil. Wow. We might use a slightly more powerful source. Yes. We're going to use a student-powered source, sledgehammer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if we were doing a larger scale survey, we may use a, uh, a source, well, one of the sources we have is called a Betsy gun, which basically fires a shotgun shell into the ground. So that's sort of a more powerful it's loud. source. Very loud. <laughs> uh, I wish we could use it today, but I couldn't get permission from uh, security to I do understand. it. I understand. Dr. Galiff and I worked with the students placing the geophones into the ground. After they were all placed, we went to use the machine, which required some manpower. What this will do, it's got a little metal strip in. So when this hits the ground, that metal strip makes a contact and forces this system to start recording. So it basically tells this system the moment that you're actually going to start recording. So we need to obviously plug it in, minor technicality. So plug that in there. You want to take a shot with this? I'd love to. All right. What so I want you to do is hit that plate. Just kind of just medium or really hit it? Hit it hard. Hit, hit it, it hard. hard. <laughs> Get down. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. I guess you just kind of just come right at it. Don't yep. You? Like this right here. My little baby right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's try this again. Try again. After a couple of strikes, we were able to see some results, which the students would use in their analysis of the area. The world of geological science is technical, involved, and according to the students at the University of Alabama, interesting and fun. I learned a lot about the program here and encourage anyone with a love for exploration to look into a career in the geological sciences field. Coming up next, I'll go to TTL in Tuscaloosa where I'll be able to put some of what I learned in class to use in the real world. But first, this week's job and training opportunities. Now, here's a look at this week's job and training opportunities from across Alabama. All of these opportunities are for pre-employment training through AIDT, unless otherwise stated. In Chambers County, MP Tech America is seeking production operators and maintenance technicians for its new metal stamping facility in Cusetta. MP Tech America is a Tier 2 supplier of automotive parts to Agene USA. A high school diploma, or GED, is required, together with a strong work ethic, commitment to quality and safety, and excellent communications and team member skills. Also in Chambers County, Daedong Hilex of America is seeking assembly operators, maintenance technicians, and team leaders for its new manufacturing facility in Cusetta. Hilex will supply automotive parts to Kia Motors Manufacturing. Assembly operators will need a high school diploma or GED and good communication skills. Previous automotive industry experience is preferred. That's a brief look at some of the training and career opportunities available this week on the job. For more information on these and other opportunities, visit our website at www.onthejobtv.org. Construction projects can be seen in almost every city in America. Unless you work in this industry, the average individual is not aware of the many varied aspects of construction. For TTL, their role in construction includes geotechnical, analytical, and environmental services, all which are linked to geological science. Located in Tuscaloosa, TTL works with their clients to implement cost-effective programs for construction challenges posed by construction site conditions and geotechnical restraints. In layman's terms, they ensure that the land is fit for construction as well as creating foundation designs to ensure that the structure being built is sound. When we visited TTL, they were working on one of their latest projects, Bryant Denny Stadium. There I met Brian Harvey, who explained to me what they were there to do. We test concrete, we test soil for, for streets, uh, we got what they call compaction, so you got to make sure it's compressed the right amount. Uh, asphalt testing. We want to make sure that it's meeting the job specifications that uh, was written out for this particular job. What we did was a, what they called a slump test, which is what we consider workability, how to flow with that concrete, you know, when they work with it out on the job. Uh, we had a, an air meter, which is trapped air. 
want to see how much air they had. Like I said, all that revolves right back to the, the job specs. They, they call out how much air they want for this job, how much slump they want for this job. And then we did, in most cases, four cylinders test specimens. We break one at seven days, two at 28, and we hold one just in case it did not meet the, the, the compressive strength. And uh, that's what we do with those. While on the work site, we performed a slump test. So we loaded some concrete in a wheelbarrow and took it to the staging area for testing. All right. All right, so we're at our home base then, right? Yeah, we got 15 minutes to get everything you see right here done. We gotta do, what Brett got there is a slump cone. We got, we do it in three layers, and we use this uh, rod. We gotta go 25, what well, we say blow, it was really strokes. 25 strokes, each three equal layers. And that happens for everything you see here with our, this is what we call it, air meter. This, this concrete's got so much, Trained air in it. We check it, make sure it's in with specs. These are six by twelve cylinders. Of course, we're gonna make our specimens off of this, and we're gonna break them later on in the week. Okay. All right. And, uh, what he's done is we, we also check the temperature. They have requirements on it. You know, we can start pushing 95 degrees. We gotta get with our contractor and say, hey, what's what's the limit? We need to start making changes. So you don't want to have hot hot cement out no, here. No, sir. With the slump test, it involves mixing, measuring, and analyzing to ensure that the concrete mixture has enough air according to the job specs. This has to be done fairly quickly because the concrete will begin to cure. So do you have to read the specs? Or? We do. We do. Okay. We're, we're, we're knowing each column, if they got a certain mix design, PSI 4000, maybe 5000, we want to know if the concrete truck, truck comes out here. Or, well, 5,000, 4,000, we need to know that. Mm -hmm. so we, we know each column, what, what they're designed mix for. We're <coughs> there to check to make sure it's the right mix. And that's why you're here. That's why we're here. After the slump test, Brian took us out to another one of TTL's work sites. At this site, a new road was being constructed. Brian explained TTL's involvement in this project. And you told me, but I, I guess, what am I trying to, to figure out right now with what we're doing? What, what, what is this going to tell you? ultimately. Percent compaction. Com percent compaction. How compact did they get this material? And that's going, for, for what reasons? For water drainage? I mean, could, what, what could it be for? Stability. You, you don't, you know, if they were to come in here and just throw dirt in and we lay asphalt on it, you just have a, a bumpy oh. road. This process requires operating a drive pin which Brian explained and showed me how to operate. I'm going to pull the pin out. We won't be able to do I'm not going to take off like a rocket anywhere. Oh, no, no. No, <laughs> you're fine. And what, and what is the name of this machine? Just a, that's not even a machine. It's not a machine. It's just a... That's just a standard drive pin. Drive pin. Okay. All right. You have to pick it up, buddy. Oh, I mean, just for, and when we yeah, get down it, with it. Drive it about eight inches is what we're looking for. That's good. All right. Now we just reverse, just pop it back up. Okay. There you go. Put a little meat behind it. Yep. All right. All right. Now you put your pin back in that top slot. So I'm moving too too slow for you and Brent. Y'all be done done about four of these <laughs> to my one over here. All right. That part's done. Now that part's you gotta get the gauge. All right, we'll go get the gauge. All right. Once we drove the pin into the ground, Brian placed a mechanism called a probe into the hole created by the drive pin. The probe measures the wet density and the moisture content. Brian uses the data to find the dry density of a particular area. Because the probe is a nuclear source that emits radiation, not everyone can use it. You know, it's a very minute, but it is a radiation machine, so just like you see the RNs in the hospital and stuff like that are running x-ray machines. We have the same apparatus that we want to make sure we're not getting any exposure from the gauge and we turn those in monthly by monthly and just to make sure all of our technicians are, have been safe or you know make sure the gauge and we do leak tests on these gauges every month to make sure there's no leakage too so we take extra care with these gauges. 
Okay. Back at the lab, we met Mitch Clark. Mitch works as the lab manager, and he explained the testing done in the lab and why testing is important. The lab here consists of concrete testing. Uh, we do all of the laboratory testing on the concrete cylinders and such that we did in, performed in the field. And soil, we do all the soil testing here to just check, check for soil characteristics, uh, make sure the soil's meeting project specifications and such as that. And then we use that laboratory data here out in the field and we can compare results and uh, make sure projects are being built as they're supposed to be. Earlier, out in the field, we did the slump test. Now, back here in the lab, Mitch is about to show me one of the tests they run on those samples. Here we are. All right. So what's this room called, Mitch? This is our concrete lab. Uh, we have a concrete brake machine here. Mm -hmm. This is what we use to determine the strength of our compressive strength of our cylinders. Okay. Uh, we have water baths to keep our cylinders at uh, specified temperatures and constantly moist. Okay. Uh, those are uh, requirements of the uh, test procedure. All right. And we're about to test one. Yeah, we will. Okay. We've got a nice little digital readout here. It tells us all the information. All we have to do is record it. These are our standard cylinders <clears throat> with uh, neoprene pad caps. And we use these because when you break these cylinders, you want them to be completely perpendicular and have a plainness factor. Mm -hmm. Those are two critical things on, 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 a, on getting a correct uh, break. Okay. And when you say one break... Is, one that's reliable. When you say break, tell me what a, a break a means. Break, a break is the compressive strength. Okay. We, we put the cylinder in here and load it until it actually fails. And where that failure is, that's where we get our maximum load and then hence we can determine our compressive strength. Mitch set up the machine by entering the size of the cylinder. The data received from this test will be sent to TTL's client, listing the PSI of that particular cylinder. As the amount of weight increased, the cylinder finally reached its limit. <laughs> I didn't expect that. You see it all the time. Yeah, yeah. We have a wrap that'll go around it that'll prevent it from really just shattering like that, but it's always nice to see that happen. Well, I mean, is this what you wanted? Yeah, that's exactly what you want. You um, want to break this thing? Yes, yes. And then we'll record certain data here. You want to you want to break these things at 990 pounds per second. We broke it at 920, so we we're pretty close to our mark. Uh, 179,410 pounds, 6,350 6, psi strength concrete which is really good. Really good concrete. More than likely this job called for about 4,000 PSI and exceeded it by 2,300. There's more to TTL services than what we've seen today. There are several other testing operations and chemical laboratories housed on site to test a multitude of things. Additionally, their services reach further than just the boundaries of Tuscaloosa County. Well, initially TTL stood for Tuscaloosa Testing Laboratories. But when the company grew and added a Montgomery office, they shortened that to TTL. And subsequently, we've grown to Decatur, Alabama, and Albany, and Valdosta, Georgia, and Nashville, Tennessee. But we, we have four primary service lines that we focus on. We do geotechnical engineering, which is soil and foundation investigations and design. We do analytical laboratory work, where we test drinking water, wastewater, hazardous constituents. We do materials engineering and testing and we do environmental consulting. What is, I guess, what is TTL known for right now? I mean, what's, the, what's some of the big projects you guys are working on? Um, probably the, the bigger projects that we're working on right now is we're doing the downtown uh, convention center in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we're doing Bryant-Denny Stadium here in Tuscaloosa. We're doing the Archbold Hospital in Thomasville, Georgia. And um, we do the geotechnical investigation where we go out and take soil samples, design the foundations, uh, give site grading recommendations to the designers, and then we follow up and subsequently do testing and inspection for quality assurance, quality control. For people that are, you know, in a community college system or even in high school and want to go into this type of work, you know, what courses could they brush up on? Well, um, typically you'll get specific training for each type of inspection or testing work that you do at a company like ours. But most of our field technical people have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree in a science-related uh, field, whether it's an environmental science degree, geology degree, 
uh, biology degree. We have a lot of chemists here that work in our analytical laboratory. And then we have uh, registered professional geologists and registered professional engineers. The Geological Sciences program at the University of Alabama shares an interest with TTL as it relates to working with the environment. From analyzing minerals and other natural artifacts to ensuring the stability of natural landscaping for major construction, the field of geology helps us in new discoveries, new technologies, and new earthly mysteries, which in turn helps our community grow. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions about this or any other on-the-job program, feel free to contact us via email at feedback at onthejobtv.org or mail us at On The Job TV, One Technology Court, Montgomery, Alabama, 36116. Next week on The Job, we'll learn about the careers and educational opportunities in the field of biotechnology when we visit UAB's biotechnology program in Birmingham and Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology in Huntsville. We'll also give you information on some of the job and training opportunities from around the state. That's all next week on The Job.